Hello and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're going to be hosting a special event hosted by the Women's Global Alliance for Peace uh, in collaboration as well with International Crisis Group. Um, the International Crisis Group is an independent organization working to prevent wars and shape policies that will build a more peaceful world, providing independent analysis and advice on how to prevent, resolve or mitigate deadly conflict. I highly encourage all of you to go on their website and read their reports. Um, this year is actually the crisis group's 25th anniversary on the front lines of conflict prevention. And it's very timely that in December 2020, crisis group launched its new initiative, Women's Global Alliance for Peace. The Women's Alliance was set up to support crisis groups work to bring women's voices to the forefront to promote gender sensitive means of peace and reconciliation early in crisis situations and ultimately to reduce or avoid the immense suffering caused by war which brings me to the topic of today's conversation we're going to be covering the inclusion of women in yemen's peace process and we have a fantastic panel to be um, to be having this discussion with. Uh, let me introduce the speakers. We will be talking to Peter Salisbury, who is the Crisis Group's Senior Analyst for Yemen. Um, Peter is a former journalist and energy editor for the Middle East Economic Digest. He has more than a decade of wide-ranging experience in journalism, and he has also uh, published a series of highly regarded papers on Yemen for Chatham House where he's a former senior consulting fellow. We'll also be hearing from Azade Moaveni. Azade Moaveni is Crisis Group's Gender and Conflict Project Director. She's a journalist, writer, and academic who's been covering the Middle East for nearly two decades now. And she's also an author. Her most recent book is Guest House for Young Widows, which tracks the lives of 13 women who joined the Islamic State. We'll be speaking to Bilqis El Lahabi, uh, we're delighted to be welcoming her, um, a Yemeni pro-democracy activist in the realm of women's rights, human rights, and political freedom. She's also the leader of a coalition of civil society organizations that played an important role in 2011 revolution in Yemen. And in April 2015, after her home was destroyed by an explosion, she fled to Jordan and has been living there since. Um, we'll be speaking to Sosen El Rufai. Sosen is a Yemeni researcher and development practitioner and the public policy and advocacy expert. In this capacity, Sosen has provided technical support to government, civil society, and international organizations around the world. Um, we'll be hearing from Laura Mitchell. Laura Mitchell is the senior gender advisor to the Office of the Special Envoy of the Secretary, Secretary General for Yemen at the UN. And she has extensive international development field experience in conflict zones across the Middle East, including work with the Palestinian Women's Movement, Civil Society, and Women Mediator Networks. She's also a senior advisor to the Norwegian Center for Conflict Resolution, where she works in the area of gender and inclusivity in dialogue, mediation, peace processes, and transitions. Uh, we'll be hearing from Sarah Pryke, who is the Director of Philanthropy at Crisis Group, responsible for developing and implementing organizational strategies for philanthropy, global initiatives, including Women's Alliance. So as you can see, we have a great panel on board today. Um, I'm going to start first by giving you a bit of an idea about the format of the event. So first of all, we'll have a short introductory <clears throat> welcome to the Women's Alliance by project director as a day. So, um, and then after that, we'll be having a discussion, a conversation with Sosan, Bilgis, Laura, and Peter, uh, followed by a Q&A session where we'll be giving you the floor to ask the questions you may have after hearing the discussion. So without further ado, please welcome as a day, the gender project director. Uh, thank you so much, Noel, uh, and a really warm welcome to all of you. Um, I'm so delighted um, to, to be uh, amongst all of you today, um, and many thanks to our really wonderful panel um, who's come together uh, to, to talk about Yemen. Um, I'm just going to say a very few words uh, about the Gender and Conflict Project at, at Crisis Group and also the Women's Alliance. Um, as many of you know... 
I'm really sorry. Let me just interrupt you for one second. Uh, I forgot to clarify that you can switch on the interpretation. Uh, if you're using your computer device, you'll see a globe at the bottom of the screen of your Zoom screen, where you must choose whether you want to be listening to this conversation in English or Arabic. And if you're using your telephone mobile device, you can click on the more sign at the bottom of the screen where you can listen in Arabic or, in, or English. Apologies, Azade, please uh, carry on. No, no, not at all. Um, just a quick word about our gender and conflict project um, to, to sort of set the stage. Um, what we do is try to stream an awareness of gender dynamics into all of crisis groups work into how we map, understand, and try to manage and prevent conflict. Um, we specifically look at four themes, the different roles that women, men, and people of all genders play in conflict, uh, the nature of their interactions with violence, uh, whether it's active or coerced, somewhere in between, uh, the differing motivations that men and women uh, have for choosing uh, to back political violence or working for peace, um, the backgrounds, often the sort of biographies of, of marginalization that they might bring to that choice. Uh, we look at the different ways that women and girls experience um, and are impacted by war and conflict, the way it affects their well-being, security, their development, their access to public space and politics. Um, we look at the way that conflict actors, and, and by that I, I include states uh, and not just insurgent groups uh, and, and the different kind of actors that we see, uh, use gender as a terrain in conflict uh, by mobilizing men and women to armed group differently, using sexual violence or assassinations of women uh, as a tactic of war to gain leverage, uh, and often also controlling women's bodies, limiting their rights and freedoms as a kind of foundational part of a state or a movement's power and ideology. Uh, lastly, we look at women's political participation, uh, their inclusion in politics and in peace processes, uh, when and how that's genuine and meaningful and looking at the challenges and the obstacles that are often um, posed in the way to that. Uh, we believe really strongly that women's involvement, and, and I think this is what the conversation today will, will revolve around, that their involvement in peace processes uh, is critical, not just as a normative goal or value because it's fair or equitable or the just thing, but also because it's more effective. Uh, women are often really highly influential on the ground um, in, in conflict trains and in societies that are racked by conflict. I think we'll hear a lot about this too. Uh, there are popular uh, activity, their ground level activity is part of the politics that brought about the conflict and that you know, diffuses it in places. So ensuring that women are represented uh, in a genuine and meaningful way in transition agreements uh, and talks makes those outcomes more durable, more effective, and also will put a society on course to make changes that will make future bouts of violence uh, less likely. Um, I think we really believe that raising awareness of the challenges to all that is critical, um, not only in the policy sphere, but in the public domain. Um, I think we really believe quite strongly that engaging a broader audience, um, sometimes a, a, a less specialist audience, is really critical in this process. Um, and that's partly because I think often the kind of recommendations that we wish to make uh, are politically quite sensitive. Uh, what might advance prospects for women um, may not be the most palatable or convenient recommendation from the vantage uh, of a whole range of, range of actors involved. Um, and that's why conversations like today and this process is so important. I think we see it as a way to build consensus around and shift, hopefully shift the conversation publicly in a way that makes, that helps us make clearer and, and bolder recommendations that are ultimately um, aim to not just be sensitive to conflict, but transform the conflict uh, from a gender perspective. Um, lastly, just a word about the Women's Alliance for Peace. Uh, we're so pleased to be partnering partnering together. Uh, the Women's Alliance for Peace came about um, largely out of the desire and motivation to advance this kind of work, uh, which I think takes a lot of passion and dedication and, and really does take 
uh, some shared values around, you know, valuing the importance of supporting women and girls who are impacted by conflict, um, the, the need and the importance to make their views central to our analyses of conflict. Um, and then also finally, you know, the importance of advancing the work of researchers and analysts who are working um, around peace and conflict prevention from this specific perspective. Um, so it's very much a partnership. Um, and, and I think my colleague Sarah will speak a little bit more about this too, between uh, funders, women leaders and crisis group based on the idea that pooling our resources, our thinking, our vision and, and our commitment will be a, a powerful way to uh, bring some fresh motivation and backing uh, to this approach, which we do think really needs its own champions. Um, so that's it from me. Um, back to you, Noel, um, and so look forward, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Azadeh. And, you know, some of that work that you speak of is the report that everyone can now find on the International Crisis Group's website, uh, bringing women back into Yemen's political process. And I know a lot of you haven't had the chance to read that report before watching this discussion. So we've got Peter Salisbury, uh, who will be presenting the findings of that report before we go ahead with our discussion. So Peter, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Noel. Um, thank you to everybody who is attending this morning and thank you in particular to, to our, our speakers and, and panelists. I'm going to try and keep my comments as short as possible so we can get into our, our Q&A session um, and really dig into to what I think is going to be a, a great conversation um, this morning. Just a quick note, I'm working across two screens. I'm going to look over here at my notes I'm not just staring off into to space and trying to ignore you. I, I wish I could work out a better system for, for this. But look, this, this report um, came out of a, a wider process that we've under, been undertaking at, at Crisis Group, where at the time, five years into Yemen's war, um, so at the beginning of 2020, we really wanted to, to ask a fundamental questions about the way that people were approaching conflict resolution in Yemen and peace building in Yemen. And those are two separate things really. So stopping the fighting and building towards some kind of, of peace in, in Yemen. It also comes in the context of the efforts that Azadze um, describes, our efforts to be better um, and do more in terms of bringing questions of gender, gender sensitivity into our research and, and our work. This is, bluntly, um, this may be a surprise looking and hearing from me, um, something of a new field for me and some, been something of a, a steep learning curve for me. And I think I should put that out there first and, and foremost. My background is primarily in economics, politics and, and conflict. Um, so we're, we're very proud of the fact that we put the time, effort and resource into this report and tried to build our internal understanding of um, questions of, of gender, gender dynamics, conflict sensitivities around, around gender. But I think we're, we're far from perfect on this issue. And I think this is the beginning of a process for us as, as crisis group rather than uh, a one and done report. Um, so just to, to make the, the note that this is, is really sort of the beginning of something and we hope to be integrating this kind of work into all of our, our reports in, in future, which is a, a big and a long-term un undertaking. Um, and last July, we, we published a big report looking again at the, the way that the peace process had, had taken place up until now, political efforts had taken place un until now, that advocated, among other things, for a more inclusive political process in, in Yemen. And we broke down multiple options for the UN and international players to, to consider. One was simply adding some of the, the key political and armed groups who are currently left out of the talks. So the main kind of quote unquote power players. Another was to have a really expansive political process, bringing women, civil societies, local, local governance actors, tribal actors, and a third option was to, to look at kind of a parallel tracks where you're trying to address some of those, those local dynamics and bring in some of these, these actors who are sort of the, the peace advocates and the unarmed actors into a process then, then feeds into a national political process 
as and when that, that comes along. This time last year, given the, the intensity of violence on, on the ground, it didn't seem very likely that we were going to move towards a political process very quickly. But we had already begun asking this, this question of what does preparedness for a political process look like? Because the, the challenge that we highlight in that first report in Rethinking Peace in, in Yemen is the, the phasing of efforts to, to bring more actors beyond the, the normal political and armed actors into the political process. And a lot of what was being discussed was about, let's get a, a ceasefire, let's get the, the parties, quote unquote, to talks, um, and then let's think about bringing other people in. And what that means is you're moving towards having a, a political settlement where these, these additional groups don't actually have a say in the substance of, of that settlement. So what we, we argued for at the, the time was that this parallel track should start as, as soon as possible and should be connected to some form of international working or contact group that would really advocate on the behalf of, of those people involved in, in this, this track. And one of the things that we highlighted in, in the report was that women's participation would be particularly important in such a track and in, in such a, a, an approach and in the, the process in, in general. And what we wanted to do was come back to this um, because the critique that we heard again and again was when people talk about gender and when people talk about women's participation in Yemen and all political processes, it's an add-on and it's an extra line that you crisis group add into your, your report and then you, you tick your box and then you accuse the UN um, of ticking their box. Um, and what we wanted to do was, was come back and give this the full ICG treatment. And we have a very specific approach and a very specific methodology uh, at ICG. We're very focused on sort of the tactical and strategic approaches that will end, resolve conflict and move us towards peace building. And we, we see those as kind of part of a, a longer term holistic peace. And we try and give policy advice that resonates with policymakers. And our, our motto as an organization is that we talk to all parties. And what that means is that if any group involved in, in a conflict reads one of our reports, they should recognize themselves in our writing as we represent them. And that includes the, the international actors involved in, in the conflict. So what, what we wound up doing was spending a lot of time speaking to women involved in national politics, women involved at the local level in NGOs, CSOs, in, in peace building. And here I should mention the, the incredible work of my former colleague, Maria Rodriguez Schapp, who did really the, the heavy lifting on, on a lot of the, the interview process for, for this report and without whom it, it would not exist and who I think is is here this, this morning somewhere out there on, on the, the Q&A. The Q um, so this, this was very much a, a team effort and team thinking and, and Maria really did the, the hard work there. Um, and we also interviewed a lot of people, male national actors, political actors, people at the international level to get their perspectives on, on this. And really the, the, the findings are, are, were as follows. Before the, the conflict began, and, and this is a very simplistic narrative and we can dig into it a lot more during the Q&A session, before the conflict began, women were not represented in national politics in, in a meaningful sense, but they had seen some gains. First, during the, the uprising of, of 2011, women were at the forefront of the uprisings, which came as a surprise to many international observers who had a pretty limited view of women's roles and civil society's role in Yemeni politics. Then during the transitional process of 2012 to 2014, women were able to fight for a place at the table, ensure 30% participation at the UN-led National Dialogue Conference, which led to a, a series of more than a thousand recommendations that formed the basis for a, a, a new constitution and were able to make some, some tactical gains over the time. So the base was still low during the transition. No one can claim that um, there had been sort of a, a jump to light speed in terms of women's representation, inclusion within national 
national politics, but it was a significant improvement and the trajectory and trend was moving in what we might call the, the right direction. And what's happened over the course of, of the war, I'd say are three broad trends. The, the first has been the narrowing of the focus of international efforts um, across the, the board. At the beginning of the, the conflict, the, the story was that it could be ended fairly quickly. We had a UN resolution 2216, which although it talks um, at length about inclusion and indeed about women's participation, also names just two parties um, as, as the primary belligerents in the conflict. And that was tactical. It was meant to bring the, the military conflict to an end as quickly as possible so that this inclusive process could be resumed. But what's happened over the course of six years quite naturally is the focus has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. There's been less of a conversation about inclusivity and there's been more of a conversation about how do we get these two groups to stop the, the shooting. But at the same time, we've seen this deep fragmentation in terms of power, politics, local governance across the board in Yemen. So we no longer have just two parties, if we ever did, really involved in, in the war itself and in local governance and in local stability. And we've seen two trends really broadly for, for uh, or three trends in, in terms of women, which is sort of a, a very broad group to be, to be describing. Um, and we talk in the methodological notes of the, the reports about sort of how sort of, it, it's a, a very broad definition to talk about women. There are as many Yemeni women's groups and viewpoints as there are political factions in, in Yemen. But the broad trends have been, one, women have been among the, the group most affected by the conflict, specifically by the, the humanitarian situation by displacement, but also by some of the, the worst effects of, of the violence, including sexual violence and partner violence because of the, the economic aspects of the, the conflict. They have almost completely lost their, their place at the, the table politically as this focus has narrowed to quote unquote, the, the parties. And in some places and in some parts of the country, they have actually been able to develop a stronger role at the local level while being almost completely excluded by the national parties um, at the, the, the national level. Um, and what, what that brings us to um, in terms of the, the reports are two, two broad arguments. The, the first is that when we look at the, the local level, we are convinced that if you just have a, a political settlement that is simply two parties um, attempting to divvy up power, create some sort of power sharing settlement, that that's really not representative of realities on the ground. And that any political settlement, any ceasefire arrangement really needs to start grappling with these local sensitivities. And secondly, when we look at the people who have best communicated these local issues and who have done the most to stabilize, to build peace, to address these issues, they are by and large local governance actors, civil society organizations, and in particular women's groups and women's representatives at the international level. And as we think about what's happening right now with the US injecting more energy into the political process in Yemen, into efforts to move towards a ceasefire, our primary concern is that while we, we absolutely agree that a ceasefire is fundamentally important, there is a danger here that if we, we move too quickly towards political settlement, we don't address the, the ground up issues and we don't find a way of connecting them with the, these sort of very top down national issues. And we argue in the report that one of the, the best ways to bring sort of this, this grass loop, grassroots glue into, into the, the picture is by improving women's inclusion in national politics, um, by introducing quotas for the, the parties and for delegations attending any form of, of UN-led talks, but also by working very, very hard on this, this parallel track. And when we talk about a parallel track, what we're really talking about is trying to find people who can rep represent these different localized viewpoints, these different thematic viewpoints uh, across the board, which is extremely hard and find a way of, of getting people within that track 
which is sort of like a, a super track two, if, if you like, um, to better represent, um, not to better represent, I misspoke there, to, to bring their agenda to the table as the substance of a political settlement is being uh, discussed rather than being tacked on at the, the very end. And the, the reason we make this suggestion is, is sort of this, this concern that we hear again and again from policymakers where they say, yes, inclusion is important, but at one and the same time, um, we can't have a, a 30 million person um, political process. And then on, on the, the flip side of it, um, we hear this, this call from the, the local actors that we, we talk to, from the women we talk to, for better integration of things like capacity building and protection of people working in civil society, bringing these concerns to the table and having a feedback loop between the, the, the international, the national political and the, the, the ground level. Um, uh, that's that's the, the very basic overview. Um, I've probably spoken a little bit too, too long and I wanna get us to the, the Q&A session. Um, I've told all of our panelists that um, they should be as critical as they like. We really want this to be a, a free flowing conversation and we wanna hear what we got right and what we got wrong as we begin this process of integrating better gender analysis into our work. So thanks very much for, for listening to me and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, it's, it's a great report and I really encourage everyone to read it, but today is results day and I can't think of a better panel uh, to discuss the report and its findings um, than Bilqis, Sosan and Laura. So I'm really looking forward to going ahead with the discussion and hearing what they think about your findings, uh, but congratulations on the report. So first, I want to start with Bilqis. Um, Bilqis, you know, women, like Peter mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, played a leading role in the revolution in 2011 um, and also took part in the transition period in 2012 um, with President Hadi and especially in the national dialogue. You were there on the ground. So can you tell us a bit more about that time? Uh, Hi, everyone. Yes, uh, I have been uh, present on the ground uh, in every uh, step of that uh, process. I want to share with you a very uh, short uh, presentation, brief one, uh, explains that phase. We were here in 2011, and uh, we were in that situation when we were in the uh, forefront uh, revolutionaries, and we had uh, loud voices. We were also here, and in 2013, we were here uh, in the uh, forefront of the National Dialogue Conference as uh, heads of uh, teams and uh, deputy heads uh, and rapporteurs of uh, groups. And in 2020, the situation is like that when uh, the uh, new government was formed. So you may imagine where we were and where we are now. Try to uh, in the screen sharing so we can only say that uh, these uh, pictures uh, are telling the uh, story uh, the, uh, the uh, participation of women before 2011 was symbolic and it was by a political decision or a political will it was not because of uh, uh, good faith. Uh, it was because uh, politicians uh, had uh, their uh, perspective, but they wanted to uh, monopolize uh, power and wealth. Uh, women do not represent that. Uh, women uh, represent the voices of people, and uh, the regime then wanted uh, to have a window dressing and try to 
make itself uh, better uh, by showing women in some uh, positions. But in uh, 2011, we had a popular uprising. It was a revolution. It was uh, a uh, uh, a revolution uh, that is based on the will of people and uh, Yemenis were not representing political parties when they revolted, they were representing themselves. Uh, and uh, here uh, we go back to the uh, theme, uh, is there a partnership uh, between uh, the uh, two halves of the society? Uh, women participated in that revolution in order to represent the voices of people. And uh, women uh, moved uh, to the transitional uh, period or transitional uh, stage. They were qualified uh, for that. And there was a very uh, strong uh, presence uh, uh, for the uh, international uh, community. And the UN uh, Special Envoy was uh, very well aware about that. And he had very good aides uh, who helped him, who whispered in his ears uh, uh, in order to empower women. They told him that uh, women were in the forefront and they have suffered a lot. They uh, they received uh, bullets uh, and they were abused by the head of the regime and by their uh, uh, revolution uh, comrades uh, and uh, therefore it was the international voice uh, that uh, put uh, women as part of the GCC initiative. Uh, the GCC initiative uh, said that women should be uh, represented uh, appropriately in the National Dialogue Conference. And then we had the National Dialogue Conference preparations and we had uh, the uh, preparation committee. It was chaired by Dr. Uh, I uh, missed uh, her name, though I uh, respect her very much. Uh, and uh, she was the head of the uh, proprietary committee. And then we had another proprietary committee. And uh, women presence in that committee made their presence in the national dialogue inevitable. Uh, uh, so. In the proprietary committee, women insisted that women should be represented in the NDC. And the independent women played a very important role. I cannot say that the NDC represented all Yemenis uh, because uh, it was a job. It's a form that you fill in and the independent uh, people applied and political parties uh, selected their representatives. And uh, for the uh, independents, they did not represent uh, all parts of Yemen and uh, did not represent all Yemenis. And therefore, I object uh, to the notion that the NDC was uh, very inclusive and represented everyone. I was representing myself, for example, in that uh, NDC. So we were very keen to have the uh, voice of women who took part in the revolution represented in the NDC. And uh, there within the NDC, yes, the voices of women were loud, but there were too many things to address and uh, the allocation of members to uh, different teams was based on the wish of the leadership of the NDC, not, uh, uh, and uh, that was not optimal, probably. And women uh, had great responsibilities in the NDC, which is to manage the dialogue within uh, the uh, the rooms of the uh, dialogue, but uh, men were uh, meeting in the afternoon in their private sessions, uh, and uh, there was the um, where the real conversations and the dialogue was taking place uh, there. So the uh, voices of women, we cannot say that women had all one voice and that they uh, represent absolute uh, peace and justice. No, women uh, had their uh, different voices and they had their aspirations for power and wealth. So women are not angels, they are humans and we have to deal with them as such. So, um, Portraying women as uh, being the icon of everything good uh, is also problematic because uh, it is uh, overburdening women. And uh, Adam, Prophet Adam, cannot uh, uh, adhere uh, to all these standards. Uh, so 
I was managing one of the most difficult uh, causes uh, in the NDC, which was the uh, Southern issue. And uh, that uh, issue uh, saw the big deals uh, happening in the background. Uh, some polarization uh, was there, and this uh, Southern issue was uh, blocked uh, because uh, some representatives uh, did not show up and uh, some uh, representatives were confined inside the hotel because uh, they did not agree uh, to the ideas of President Hadi and therefore he locked them up in the uh, Mozambique Hotel. And uh, the international uh, community or the civil society did not move to empower women to emerge as leaders that can make changes. We were 556 representatives in a very small space. So it was a little state, the Mozambique Hotel, and the responsibility on us was to establish an idea for a new uh, state. It was very problematic and it was difficult. Uh, this uh, was uh, since uh, 2011 until 2013. I personally, I withdrew from the NDC in September 2013 for uh, reasons uh, that uh, the uh, decisions uh, made in my team in the NDC were not based on the opinions of the representatives. The decisions were brought from outside and the team would rubber stamp them. And I had some objections to some of the findings and therefore I withdrew or I quitted. So we have to uh, move on. We cannot stay in history uh, forever. And therefore, uh, women uh, remained in the uh, shadow in Yemen, although they have started a kind of a momentum in uh, Yemen. And uh, women uh, managed uh, to rescue uh, people uh, from uh, prisons and from death sentences because they moved at the national and at the international level. Uh, and it was uh, not uh, the United Nations, it was uh, women, uh, women, uh, women and men who worked at the national level in Yemen, uh, and their uh, voices were heard by international parties, and they have exercised lobbying and uh, pressure on certain issues, uh, such as the child marriage and political rights for women and citizenship rights for women and things like that. So women in the NDC uh, managed uh, to have the right of quota, but they did not uh, manage to uh, fix it with a, a strong article or provision in the Constitution. The article in the Constitution was very broad uh, and uh, flexible. It says uh, a quota of no less than 30%, uh, but they have added some conditions uh, to that uh, provision, and therefore uh, this does not show some good intentions. Uh, moving to the issue of women and peace, all uh, parties, including women, uh, Reem, kept uh, looking for justifications for women participation on the table and uh, uh, on the political uh, negotiations table. Women now in Yemen are not uh, represented on the table of food uh, because there is uh, starvation, hunger and uh, poverty and uh, women are not represented on the food table now in Yemen. For uh, the uh, inclusion of women on the table of peace, uh, it is all about the uh, stereotyping of women. We need to uh, deal with this issue as a right, and rights should not be justified. It's a human right. It's like the right to exist. When we talk about not excluding women from the table, and uh, not excluding them from the political process, we mean that this uh, political process is uh, now uh, monopolized by certain stakeholders, uh, uh, and these stakeholders are not thinking about the national interests, they think about their own interests. The uh, women uh, representation is the representation of the society because a society composes of uh, men and women. And then we can move to the more specific representations. Uh, 
what is happening in the peace process now in Yemen is that the peace process is uh, coming to fulfill interests of uh, states, of countries, countries in the region. And these uh, countries uh, do not have any regard to the interests of the uh, Yemenis. They only think about their own interests. And uh, it is about uh, the international gains uh, in Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates uh, cannot represent the voices of uh, women for sure. And the um, different uh, parties uh, in Yemen, they do not represent women properly. Uh, yes, political parties uh, in uh, Yemen do have uh, women representation in their structures and they use women for voting. But when it is a uh, time for uh, sharing interests, uh, they try to take all the interests to themselves and disregard women, including the appointments uh, in our embassies as ambassadors uh, and the appointments in the government and every, everywhere. And therefore, this is an elite uh, that have hijacked uh, Yemen and is uh, uh, caring only about their own uh, interests. Uh, Yemen is now under Chapter 7. And the uh, Security Council is a council that is uh, representing the big players in the world. Uh, the Security Council can force these parties to represent Yemenis as men and women first and to uh, represent the interests of uh, Yemenis. I think uh, in, in the international community can play a role, but the international community has certain interests, including the arms deals. So the poor representation of women in Yemen is uh, a flagrant uh, reflection of the immorality of the international intervention in Yemen. And uh, it represents also the lack of uh, awareness about uh, women uh, from the side of the United Nations, including the uh, special envoy, who is uh, putting women next to him, but he is not allowing them to speak. This is my uh, personal perspective. Uh, one of the justifications uh, or one of the arguments uh, is that uh, women are not uh, there. Uh, we have uh, women uh, who are represented everywhere uh, and they say that women are only uh, virtually represented. No, the whole government is now uh, virtually uh, represented and women are there on the ground and they work on uh, peacemaking and resolving local acts uh, and they uh, bear the burden of the war and uh, what have you done to the mothers of the abductees uh, they have lists uh, of uh, the abductees uh, from their family members uh, were these women represented on the table no they were not represented and they were not assisted by the united nations represented by the uh, special envoy office the uh, women in the political parties, where are they? Uh, only one uh, political party respected itself uh, and presented Rana Ghanem as uh, the representative for that uh, political uh, party. And uh, Rana Ghanem is very well respected for her outstanding performance. Uh, so I stop here. Um, I would like to carry on by going to you, Sosan. Uh, you know, a lot of the reporting I've done in the last couple of years has been focused on the really, you know, um, horrifying impact the war has had on women and girls in Yemen in the last seven years. Um, with this catastrophic impact that the war is having on women and girls, why is their inclusion in the peace process so problematic? Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to be here uh, among this wonderful group. It's very difficult always to speak after Bilkis. She's a wonderful speaker. Uh, she brings all the emotions back, the good and the bad. Um, uh, I would like to say that I'm happy to speak uh, among this group, but it's very sad that for, for so many years now, we're talking about the same things and it's always about women. Um, I wanna start from where Bilkis ended. 
I have a, a personal problem with giving all these, you know, background and contextual information whenever we talk about women and the right to sit on the on the peace uh, negotiation table. Um, yes, women are having the, the the worst time in Yemen now. They're not. Uh, they're subject to uh, gender-based violence more than ever before, specifically sexual violence. Uh, they're struggling with putting uh, with food uh, security. They have all these um, livelihood challenges. Uh, COVID-19 has only uh, had its toll on women and girls. Um, but, but that's not the context that we want to put forth whenever we want to speak about the, the, the women and their right to be at the table. Women need to be at the table because they are part of the Yemeni population, because they're, they're human beings and because they're citizens of this country. And we don't have to contextualize this under, you know, within the humanitarian situation and how it, it impacts them. And, and the example that I always think about uh, is the seat belt whenever we drive our cars uh, and how you know there's there's no need to provide any information around that accidents are not going to happen if you're putting the seat belts and I see that more and more we're also being dragged into that that women's participation specifically in the peace process in Yemen because it's so multi-layered, it's very complex. And like Bulki said, there's a lot of other um, authorities and countries and sponsors that have a stake in the Yemen process, uh, peace process, that women's participation is not really gonna change anything. But it's like saying that the seat belt is, is, is not gonna prevent you from having accidents. It's as ridiculous as that. So I would like to say in the beginning that we, women need to be there because they have the right to be there. Um, why is it problematic? Uh, first, I think two main reasons that I've been uh, researching in. The first one is the systematic marginalization of women. And, and probably my first take on the report is, is its focus on how many parties are there uh, negotiating the, the, the peace process. It's not how many parties are there. It's not the that there is like two parties and we need more parties that could uh, reflect itself on the political representation in the peace process. But um, for women, the struggle has been historical. We know that uh, gender roles and, and the gender gaps exist in Yemen for so long. The political, uh, the politicians and the political parties and the warring parties are no different than the Yemeni society that still looks at women as uh, as persons who do not have political savviness, who should not exist in, in, in the public sphere. So um, what I'm trying to say is, even if we increase the political inclusion, that like Bilki mentioned as well, it's not going to reflect itself on the representation of women on the table. So we need to put that forth. It's, it's not about more inclusion of more political actors because we know that whenever there's a choice to put a, a delegation forth in a peace process negotiation, women are the last people to be thought of unless there is a, a, a cosmetic need to do that. Um, um, the second re problem with, with women inclusion is the lack of accountability. And for me, if there's no accountability, why would I be inclusive? What, what is the motivation for me to be inclusive unless there is accountability? For women, we were hoping for accountability from our uh, you know, from our government, from from the government that is clinging to the NDC outcomes to to draw its uh, legitimacy from. But that very government, as was apparent in in Bilkis's photo, uh, has given up uh, its promises to women. It's clinging to everything related to its own stay in power, but not anything related to women. Um, we were hoping for accountability from the donors and the peace sponsors, uh, including EU countries, including the US and other countries. But then the rhetoric on women is very, very, very marginal. 
it's very humble, it's very tokenized. Women come up whenever there's a, a need to brag about consultation, but in, in the real time when they meet the leaders of the warring uh, parties, women do not come up because they're not important, because it's not the time, because there are a lot of other issues that are more you know, crucial and more, um, you know, they are more uh, important to the peace process. We were hoping for support from the UN, but again, um, for me personally, being a part of, of, of two major networks in track two, um, I'm personally disappointed with everything that the UN envoy uh, office has been doing or the UN in general has been doing, particularly on the theme of uh, inclusion of women in the peace process. The support that was given to women was random, sporadic. It was uh, controlling at times. Um, the women did not, the, that were members, I speak for, for myself, we did not, I did not feel empowered enough or um, autonomous enough to make our, my own decisions and to influence the political process. Um, we know that women groups who have been trying so hard against all odds, against all harassment on the ground, again, you know, being underfunded, being also suffering from livelihood challenges, trying so hard to continue the amazing work they're doing on the ground in, in peace building and, and also in supporting the local communities. But in the same time, their voices are not being heard. Whenever, you know, all the research that is out there that is speaking to linking uh, the grassroots organizations to the peace process that speaks about track three and its importance that is speaking to let the women speak about what they need, please bring them to delegations, not necessarily physically, but even their testimonials into the delegations. All this research and evidence that is put forth is not being heard. Um, it's being ignored, I have to say. Um, and then the participation and the support of women by donors and by the UN is mostly tokenized. Um, the UN is doing a, a good job at least by mainstreaming gender in the humanitarian sector. And it's very striking that divorce between the way they handle gender issues um, and, and, and gender gaps in the humanitarian sector versus what they do to, uh, towards gender gaps and gender mainstreaming in the peace process. And for me, uh, the, the uh, explanation that comes to mind right away is, uh, we, we want to support women in the political process, in the peace process, but we don't want to steer the pot. We don't, we don't want things to get so serious um, because that will have implications on the, long, on the long run and it may impact the relation with, with the warring uh, parties or with the um, you know, state de facto or whatever on the ground. So I, I understand, and, and it comes from research, it comes from my lived experience that whenever there is a price to be paid, women are always sacrificed. If we want our offices to be open, uh, then let's, let's just, you know, whenever there's an issue with women, let's just not be quite vocal about it because we will be in trouble. If we want our delegations to continue meeting war and parties, let's not speak about women because this is a very sensitive issue. Um, and it's the accountability issue for me is very, very crucial because without accountability, there's no motive for women inclusivity. Um, and if we are waiting for the women groups who are already being harassed, already underfunded, already facing a lot of trouble inside the house, in the streets, uh, everywhere, um, they, they're not mobile, they cannot travel, they don't speak English to, to be vocal enough. Um, if we're expecting them uh, to, to do the change or if we're starting our rhetoric by criticizing them about not doing enough or not being vocal enough or not agreeing with each other or not having a uniform agenda, I would say that's, um, that is the problem, that, that the entities who, like donors and the UN agencies who speak about being uh, committed to values like gender equality, like um, you know, the Paris Declaration and, and all these values, uh, 
um, they have to walk the talk. And if they don't, then I don't think I, as a Yemeni woman, would expect anything from um, the state de facto, you know, a state that, that I have not elected, that has take, ceased uh, pa uh, the, uh, the, the role in Yemen by power um, and by arms. I would not expect them to have a female delegation, but, but the government that is claiming to be the legitimate one, at least, should walk the talk and people supporting all the parties and donors and, and government supporting that uh, government should also walk the talk. Um, so yes, I, I, just to summarize, I, I think the problem is with that the women are systematically marginalized and to assume in, in I think in a way that, that uh, a political party can just become all of a sudden so gender conscious and, and in, engage, engage uh, its female members in a peace process. It's not that simple. Um, but I, I will speak probably later about, you know, some of the good recommendations of the report. We cannot wait until the political, the politicians become gender aware all of a sudden and decide to include women. It's not gonna happen now. It's not gonna happen in, in 100 years, I think, because, because gender uh, inclusivity in peace process is a global problem. It's definitely a problem in Yemen. Thank you so much for that, Sosa. And I mean, everything you and Bilgis had to say has been really sobering, really depressing as well. Um, but it's great to be having this conversation with the both of you and to hear from both of you. And I'm sure everyone who's listening feels the same way. Um, Laura, you know, I'm going to come to you next uh, before we go back you know, briefly to Bilqis and Sosan, hopefully at the end of this discussion. But the UN has been brought up a couple of times by Bilqis, by Sosan, and, and also in the report. Uh, you're a gender expert who's worked on multi-track peace processes for several years now. So we'd really like to hear from you, your insights on the report itself and what it covered, and as well as what it missed uh, in terms of gender, when it comes to gender inclusion and the women, peace and security agenda. Thank you, Nawal. And please, um, I might not see the chat, so tell me if my time is almost up. I have timed this. I have um, got more questions for you. So oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so exactly. Go ahead with the first one, but yeah, let's, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Very good. So you know, first of all, thank you to Crisis Group, to Peter, to um, to the whole group for convening this meeting, for sharing the report, and for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, and also thank you, Peter, for starting in, in such a candid way. Um, I think all peace and security organizations around the world have a serious problem with gender equality. And my hope is that, um, and, and I have I've been with the Office of the Special Envoy not quite two years, so I, I can't respond to all of the, <laughs> All of the issues, obviously, um, but we do have a major issue. And I hope that the Me Too movement and when we see things like Black Lives Matter, I hope that we're coming back to a point globally where people will start to understand why sexism and patriarchy, how it creates violence, how women do not in any country of the world have their full citizenship rights. Um, so, but anyway, sorry, I'll stick to my, my speaking points. Um, I wanted to start by just acknowledging what I think, at least from my perspective, as really a gender expert in the process. And I'm a person who I'm committed to transformative change. So I think that um, there are two really important um, contributions. The first is the acknowledgement of the crucial roles played by Yemeni women, peacemakers, peace builders, peace actors, political activists. and. Since joining the Office of the Special Envoy almost two years ago, I have really tried every month in the Security Council briefings to raise that where I could. And I, I will just also say that I think, um, um, because I don't think it came out from my recollection of either of the reports, they're working in very dangerous and often extremely hostile contexts. And the panel of experts and group of eminent experts reports lay that out, I think, very, very clear. Um, and I think 
one of the challenges for peace and security organizations is that very many times we know that local peace actors, including women, must keep a, a, to a degree a low profile. Their critical contributions and roles are often invisible for outside analysts, for internationals like myself and like others. And then what happens is we end up with conflict analyses and a lot of reports which are focused only on the capital P political actors and the conflict parties and completely miss the role of women, uh, women peace actors and actors of change. I think um, another really important contribution of the report is that from my, my perspective, it really tries to break new ground by critically examining the two-party mediation frameworks that exist in Yemen and that are the norm in so many peace processes. And while this notion is not entirely near, new, I think this is a really important contribution and there are implications for other peace processes as well. And so I really also hope that even though this issue is often discussed in WPS uh, environments that being this is a crisis group report that it will reach a much broader audience than the usual you know, actors that um, many of us speak to. And also that, that crisis group will use this to allow these findings to percolate much further in your own work on Yemen and in other peace process uh, related work and other analytical work. I wanted though to also highlight um, what I think are a few strategic gaps and limitations. Um, and the first would be that gender inclusion and women's inclusion are, are kind of framed in a somewhat narrow way as women's representation in formal talks. Um, even if it's often, ref the reference is often to women's political participation. Um, secondly, I think there were, I counted two mentions of meaningful inclusion. The term that we often use is meaningful participation, but there was no real discussion of what women's meaningful participation means and how we could advance that within multi-track process. And another kind of gap, I think, which is hard to forgive 20 years after 1325 is that there was really no, not much of an engagement with the women, peace and security agenda for all its you know, strengths and weaknesses, um, nor was there, sufficient acknowledgement, I think, by the, of the different actors undertaken by women in Yemen, but also internationally. Um, I know there was a quote actually by Sousan, which I really liked in, in the report where she raises it, but, but yeah. So I wanted just to say that what I think um, is really important because a lot of people, unfortunately, that work in this field, they may not know the agenda that well. They may not realize that it goes back 20 years that we now have 10 Security Council resolutions. Um, some would say we have fatigue in terms of the number of resolutions. But one of the things that we have been that we've lost in these 20 years is the transformative potential of this agenda. Because what has happened, and this is where I think it's a little unfortunate with the report, is that this broad transformative agenda that was really driven by transnational women, feminist, peace activists, largely not Western, has really been lost. And, and certainly in many peace processes, and Yemen is no exception, people, when they think about women, peace and security, they think it's only about quota. Quota is extremely important. Or that it's only about getting a few women or getting women's representation. Some people have referred to this as the just add women and stir. Now, don't get me wrong, women should be represented. Women have the right to representation. And I think both Bilkis and, and Sousen have um, articulated that well. Institutions, public offices should mirror the makeup of our society. We cannot have police forces that do not represent women, for instance. And so in a multi-track peace process like this one, we really need to advocate for women's representation across all tracks as well as, and I think Sousen was the one who just mentioned it, promote linkages between those tracks. So what I'm trying to do to some degree is try to normalize and regularize, regularize women's representation as well as their meaningful participation. Now, you know we don't have a track one. The, there is no UN track one process. Um, so so I, will I, I would like to talk to that uh, 
to that point after. But what's really important, and we know this from a lot of research from a lot of other processes, representation alone, even with quota and critical mass, is insufficient. We know we need to transform our peace and security institutions, our peace processes, so that they're more conducive and supportive of women's participation and influence. We, we need transformative approaches which proactively address and prevent harassment, threats, intimidation, and violence against women. But I'm going to stop, stop there. But Laura, you know, in an already stalled peace process, um, how do you do gender inclusion? So it is indeed difficult to do inclusion in a process in a track one and formal negotiations that are stalled. But uh, yeah, I would like to kind of highlight part of what we're trying, what, what this tiny little gender team that we have, what we're trying to do. We really take up the multi-track approach. I have a background in, in track two. We know that women are normally well represented. And in Yemen, women have a long history as well of negotiating intertribal conflicts. We know that women currently lead and mediate many local dialogues. Um, we also know that even if there's no track one UN led process currently, there are at least a dozen or so track two dialogues that are going on on different themes and, and topics of re relevance. So we've spent quite a bit of time and I know hopefully some of the, our track two partners are on this call. We've been working with our track two organization partners on a monthly basis to really get them to improve on women's representation on women's meaningful participation, as well as promoting this, the issue of how do you integrate gender perspectives into the design, facilitation, and delivery of their dialogue work so that women's perspectives are represented in the reports that get fed into our process. So, and, and what I wanna say here is this is all about like rolling up our sleeves and working to normalize and regularize women's representation. Um, with the hope that and that it's harder for the parties to continue to resist women's representation. At a track one, um, I think many will know the special envoy committed last year to reserve non-transferable seats for women in future talks. And um, I'm also working on, oh, my time is up. I'm working on an initiative as well with women in political parties, but there are also a number of other kind of operational um, initiatives underway, you know, to try to push, promote, and normalize. Sorry, I'll stop there. Um, I know that So Sen had a question uh, for you, Laura. Go ahead, So Sen. Sorry, Noel, it's, it's just a comment, it's not a question. So if I may just, just comment, um, thank you, Laura. I, I just want, I think I missed in my previous um, answer to, the, to your question, Noel, that there are two things that are so linked to each other, but still separate, which is the women's representation and the women's agenda in the, in the peace process. And I think that we have a problem as women working um, on, on women and peace and security with the 1325. The, the 1325 is, is a great framework. Um, I, under, I, like, I believe in its transformational power, but in Yemen, I, I can't count the number of the UN officials who have no clue what 1325 is. So the problem with 1325 is, it's a, what we say in Arabic, um, I don't know how to translate that, but it's something that whenever there's something we cannot do or we wanna just put in a box for later, uh, we put it into the 1325 uh, box, but whenever we ask people, what does that mean? The UN itself, sometimes in many cases, they, they have no clue what that means. They may know, well, they don't even know what it means, but some of those who know what it means cannot really analyze and, uh, you know, dismantle in participation, and I love what Laura said about meaningful inclusion and meaningful participation with the Yemeni women to ask them, do you know what 1325 is? Do you think this is the framework that can serve you in the current context? Do you even want us to refer to 1325 in this particular time? I don't think this happens. So uh, 1320, that's, that's the problem with 1325. 
And the, the other problem is with the women's agenda. So when we say representation, uh, we speak to the number of women who are, you know, formally part of the peace process, but we also speak to the women's agenda, their issues, their context, who's putting that in the table. Um, I'm not, I'm not alluding that only women can speak to women's agenda, but who are we fooling? Like who wants, if you're a Houthi or if you're somebody who wants to speak about war and, and ports and oil, who wants to speak about um, gender-based violence? Uh, during a, a peace negotiation. Thank you. Laura, before I, before I move on, uh, you know, before I move on to the Q&A um, with the rest of our audience, I wanted to ask you, you know, how might more transformative approaches be promoted to bolster women's representation and the inclusion of gender perspectives in the peace process? Thanks, Nawal, and thank you very much, Sausen. For me, I just want to say 1325 is a Security Council resolution that we should use to hold our peace and security institutions to account. Uh, it's not a replacement for a national feminist or women's agenda for Yemeni women. So um, I think it's really important not to confuse the two. Women in Yemen, they articulate, they analyze their own socioeconomic and political uh, circumstances and identify what they see to be their priorities. Um, I just wanted to say that um, this issue of integration of gender perspectives, it's so important and it is so sadly forgotten. And actually, Peter, when in the very beginning, you kind of mentioned this, um, we could also talk about this as inclusive public policy making. And I believe Sousen has a background actually in public policy studies. So she's even better equipped to speak to this issue than I am. But in a nutshell, if, if I could just put it in a very simple way, this approach understands that public policy making often has an inherent male, sometimes middle class, sometimes urban bias in it. So when we try to promote inclusive public policy making, you could call it feminist public policy making, what we're trying to do is incorporate an intersectional gender analysis with the aim of creating public policies. And of course, a peace agreement is or becomes a public policy, right? that can advance in, and the rights conditions um, of women and girls, as well as factor in differences between different women and girls, rural versus urban, socioeconomic class, age, able-bodied women, women with disabilities, and so on. The focus of the peace, a peace process should be about getting to, of course, agreements. And those agreements often have constitutional force. So we have this tremendous opportunity here to try to find ways to develop and incorporate, and maybe this goes back to Selson's point about uh, uh, women's agenda or priorities for an agreement. We have this tremendous opportunity to actually move um, women's rights seriously ahead. And we can, there, there are good examples, particularly in Africa where women, women have done that. Um, maybe I just want to I could talk more about gender perspectives, but I won't, I won't talk about how we're trying to do that. And there are different ways we're trying to do that with Yemeni researchers, with women in consultations. But I'm also really trying in my role to promote greater accountability for this agenda. And I saw that there was a question. Um, we need greater accountability from all of our institutions. We need men on board. This is not a women's agenda. Women, men have to be part of the solution. And there's a tremendous amount of, amount of rhetoric surrounding this agenda by all actors. Um, and sadly, the, there's, a very, there's an excellent report that came out in 2015 by the Secretary General. It's often called the Global Study on 1325 Implementation. It's a massive, I don't know, 300, 400 page study. But it said clearly, all progress is measured in terms of firsts. So, none of us, none of our organizations is delivering as it should be. So what I've been trying to do with our tiny little gender team here is push the bar around better gender and conflict analysis. And I'm very happy to participate today because I think crisis group, you play a really important role, but you haven't exactly been, you know, it hasn't been an organization that's been at the forefront. Um, mapping studies, pressuring international actors and agencies to move beyond what we have right now, which is, and what we have in most processes, it's piecemeal, it's tick the box approaches to WPS. 
If we're going to make any serious inroads in Yemen, we all need to have strategies. We have a small, simple gender strategy. It guides my work. Um, and, and, you know, within Oseski, and I agree, you know, Sousen, most, I think, not just the UN, most peace and security organizations, they don't know, they have, there hasn't been proper gender mainstreaming. There's a lot of work ahead of us. And, you know, I don't, I just don't think that um, focusing only on representation, it's not going to change our institutions as we, as we need to have them changed. Okay, sorry, I'll stop. Thank you so much, Laura. I mean, I know we are overrunning in terms of discussion, but I can see that our attendees are finding this discussion as interesting as I am. They're all still here. Uh, so we will overrun in this event today. Um, uh, as a day, I think you wanted to add something. Um, very briefly, um, only to say um, that I'm really so grateful, Laura, for your candor um, in, in the journey, the perhaps um you know much more to much more to travel on that journey that crisis group is taking um to to bilkes for for i was very moved by your remarks bilkes um and those images of um where we were and where we ended up um and also sorry i'm just i feel like we do this with every country over and over again and we're doing it with afghanistan now and sorry, this never happens to me ever. Um, but I just want to say how much I appreciate all of your analysis and your support and your candor, because it is so hard to push this through our organizations and to persuade colleagues that this approach has to be sophisticated and it has to be, you know, multidimensional and that it has to look at all the different actors and to be brave and not reproduce uh, the exact dynamics of the different actors that you're talking about, Laura, and that Bilkis was talking about. You know, there are regional actors. You know, the UN is a collection of states with their powerful interests and their own positions on women that are not where they need to be. And, you know, we must not reproduce um, the, the overly kind of realpolitik um, accommodations for that. You know, so I think this work when we do it at crisis group, we we have to do it a little bit differently um, because I think being sensitive is not enough. I think we have to be transformative. I think we have to draw on the collective energy that we take from all of these Me Too movements and these different feminist mobilizations. And we have to do it differently. So I just, I, I will stop, but I wanted to say how much I appreciated all of your, uh, all of your remarks and your support for, for helping us take this further. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Azadeh. Um, I'm going to move on to the Q&A section uh, and starting with you, Sosan. Um, this question is from Nina Lahoud from the International Legal Assistance Consortium. I wanted, she's asking, you know, given the broad consensus among women across conflict zones, whether it's Syria or Yemen, you know, that the international UN approach of relegating women to second track mechanisms in peace processes has not been effective and mitigates their ultimate impact. impact. community to insist as a condition for support that a quota of women's civil society be applied to the composition of all negotiating parties. Uh, so Sam, this one's for you. Uh, I think that I, I personally don't think that the track two, that there's no hope from track two. I don't think there is, for me at least, there isn't a consensus that track two um, mechanisms in peace process has not been effective. They have not been effective in the context where there hasn't been uh, meaningful inclusion and participation of women, when the national agenda was and the local agenda has not been driving track two, when there has been um, a control uh, from, from donors or UN agencies over the agendas. I don't think that there is an inherent problem with track two and track two has, has provided good examples in other countries. Um, uh, and I, I don't think we the solution is because track two is not implemented well in Yemen that we have to abandon track two. I, I, I don't believe in that. I'm a track two per member. Um, I see there are 
tremendous faults in the way that it's been implemented, in the way that it's been funded, in, in the way it's been promoted. Um, but there is no inherent problem with track two. If moving forward, I think that we have um, networks that have already been established. The, the, uh, I'm humbled by all the work that's taken place on the ground by, by track three, uh, women groups, women activists working together against Oz. Um, the problem in Yemen, I think, is that those ties are not created, and if they're created, they're not sustainable, they're not funded enough, uh, they're not supported, and they're not autonomous. And I underline that, they're not autonomous, what, because funding ties the work of these groups with particular agendas, and again, um, the funding is, is telling them not to stir the pot, to work within a specific area that they they cannot go outside. Um, and I think that another way to, to really make the track too impactful is not necessarily to have some of those women again represented physically in the in the negotiation table. But what is expected from track two is to force uh, all these donors that they meet every day or that who sponsor them or who brag about them is to pressure them to have meaningful uh, participation, to have women issues and the women's agenda, meaning the issues that the everyday women faces every day because of conflict in the rhetoric, in the speech of those people who sponsor. Now, currently, I do agree that track two has been stalled. Um, there's a lot of opportunities that are being missed. And, and from here, I would, again, I, I really, um, am against criticizing women themselves for not doing enough. But what I can do is to call among ourselves to really refuse to be tokenized. And if we feel that there is a workshop or a conference or a, a meeting that will just bring us to show that we are there, that we are sitting there and we're meeting X and Y, for us to have a stand together and say, we do not want to be um, included unless we have a say, unless we influence the agenda of the peace process. Um, and again, uh, the last thing I would like to to mention probably is I am personally a researcher in, in, in peace, in peace and uh, women and security. I don't like the way how we use comparatives uh, between countries. It's sometimes uh, useful to, to look at good practices and lessons learned, but sometimes, sometimes things that worked in a, in a particular place are not going to work in Yemen. Um, and I do agree with Laura that yes, the locals need to do their agendas. They need to drive their, uh, their frameworks and action plans with the reference to the international tools, but, but always uh, discussing among themselves and deciding what works in Yemen. The, the, um, the, the model of, of track two, um, has not worked in Yemen from my point of view. It has, I, I haven't felt that it served my ambitions um, as a Yemeni woman. Uh, it, it needs to be modified, it needs to be analyzed. But again, how are we going to do that if we don't have proper protection, proper funding, if we don't have autonomy? So I hope I was able to answer the question. Thank you so much, Sosan. Uh, Bilgiz, I wanna come to you next. Um, when looking at women's involvement in peace processes, uh, this, this question is from Laura, um, but when looking at women's involvement in peace processes, what's the role played by religion? And I'm going to add to that question, uh, not just religion, but also cultural norms in Yemen society. What, what role do they play as well? Um, first of all, and uh, all of us, uh, we uh, refer uh, to the Office of the uh, Special Envoy. I uh, feel uh, sympathy with uh, Laura uh, because even women in the uh, Special Envoy Office, they need uh, Resolution 1325. Uh, the other thing concerning your question on the role of religion, I find that the answer uh, should be based on our actual experience uh, 
interpreting religion and interpreting uh, the uh, social norms uh, puts you in the uh, in a confrontation with different uh, people uh, who are uh, sometimes uh, and therefore uh, sometimes you cannot discuss these issues uh, we had uh, women uh, the uh, first picture that i have shown we had women in the change square in uh, Sana University, women were there with their with their different uh, colors. We had religious women and uh, religious women there, and uh, we uh, found uh, the uh, people there then very polite towards women. Uh, women were not uh, separated from men in the change square. Uh, women were uh, separated only when uh, the uh, political elites uh, intervened and influenced uh, the revolution and the process. Uh, these are uh, political uh, parties that uh, rely on religious ideology uh, to achieve dominance. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, if we have a political will in the country, the uh, social norms uh, can accommodate women and even a religion can accommodate women. Uh, uh, for a religion, which model we want for our religion? Do we want uh, the uh, Afghanistan model or the uh, Turkey uh, model or uh, Syria? Uh, so religion, of course, uh, plays uh, an important role in our uh, uh, life. Uh, and uh, well, there are uh, very small details related to religion that are uh, problematic. So dragging women to the square of religion and uh, traditions and norms is something different uh, powers and authorities used to uh, stifle the opposition. Thank you, Bilqis. Um, one of the questions here that struck me is from Dr. Arif al Hajj, and I'm going to put it forward to you, Peter. Um, is do you think it's really a good time for Yemeni women movements, you know, leaders and groups to conduct evaluations and critical studies about the participation of Yemeni women in peace processes? Uh, you know, why is now a good time considering everything that's going on? I mean, I, I, I argue that a lot of effort has already been put into conducting exactly those kind of, of critical studies, people like Sosan have done incredible work on this. Laura is, is working on this day in, day, day out. That, that work in many ways has been done. The critiques and the knowledge of the, the challenges and the barriers are there. The, the issue I would say right now is one of urgency, where there is this big push right now to get to a ceasefire and some kind of political talks and, and settlement. Um, and the, I think the, the fear, again, that sort of many of our interviewees raised was that if there is a political process that has no women's participation, then it will be completely unsurprising if the political settlement or political whatever comes out of that really does not reflect the, the, the perspectives of, of sort of 50% of, of the, the population. Um, so we're in this really sort of difficult moment where th this is the moment to be advocating um, for this agenda to, to really be taken seriously, um, lest this process moves ahead and becomes something of a steam train that leaves everybody else else behind. But I think sort of in terms of the, the critical studies, I think that that piece has been been done. Um, uh, as the, these guys have said. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much to all the attendees for their questions. We're gonna try and answer some of them by typing up the answers in the boxes uh, below. Um, otherwise, I really apologize for not being able to answer all your questions, but I hope that the discussion was fruitful enough to, to add as much context to the report as possible. Next, we're going to be hearing from Sarah Pryke, who's the Director of Philanthropy at Crisis Group and who's responsible for developing and implementing organizational strategies for philanthropy um, and global initiatives, including the Women's Alliance. Um, Sarah, please take the floor and welcome. Thank you. 
So it's clear that there's still much work to be done to see women fully represented in politics and peace talks, not only in Yemen, but across many conflict affected countries. And as Azude uh, said earlier in this call, addressing this issue is a priority for crisis groups, gender and conflict project, and of course, the women of the Women's Global Alliance for Peace. The Women's Alliance is an international network of women philanthropists who've come together to support women and girls affected by conflict and advance women's work as peace builders. Since our launch in December, the Alliance has grown a committed core of founding members who are driving its agenda forward, and several of them have joined us today. We're working to grow and strengthen this important network and we'll be running several special events throughout the year to raise awareness and grow our membership in order to have the greatest impact on women in conflict. If you'd like to find out more, you can find my details on our website um, and I'll be pleased to send you um, some more information or set up a virtual coffee, maybe in person over the summer uh, with one of our members as a day or myself. We hope that this conversation has inspired you to join us on our mission to support women and girls affected by conflict. And of course, the women working tirelessly to prevent it, like some of the uh, inspiring women you've heard from today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'd like to go on by thanking our fantastic speakers today. Thank you, Peter, Azade. Thank you to Bilqis, to Sosan, uh, to Laura, and to you, Sarah, as well. Um, it honestly has been a pleasure to listen to you all speak and to listen to the discussion. I've learned so much. Um, it's been incredibly sobering, and clearly there's still so much more to be done. Um, and thank you so much to all our attendees for staying online, even though uh, the event overran. I hope we get to do an event like this in person sometime soon uh, and not over Zoom. And I hope that everyone enjoyed um, the event today and we'll be in touch, the International Crisis Group will be in touch with upcoming events on the program. But until then, thank you for tuning in, stay safe, and goodbye.